Okay, we are now recording. I'm switching back to that slide. Okay, go. So, well, actually, there are two things. One is you don't you don't just have you don't need to to limit things to a directory uh, that is blessed. You could have um, a registry of say the uh, cryptographic hashes of files which are known to be pure, um, nope. and then you don't care where you got them from. Uh, that's and good. Then you, could, then you could have an out of band verification pathway that checks things and puts them in the, in that registry. Yes, yes, that would that would be and, per perfectly fine. You just and that could make things very quick, and you also don't have to worry about where to get things from. Right. Um, the the uh, story that we've had up to now with um, with the uh, the SES shim. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, uh, one of the nice things that that approach had over uh, the original Kaha approach was that it did not require an actual pass through the code. It was just strictly runtime semantics. Um, and this seems to move us back into the world where we have to have a, a parsing code checking uh, intermediary. Um, and Part of the big win of not having that was about uh, load times. And this seems to put us back in the world of expensive load times. So uh, you are uh, correct that this is a painful difference between sort of the original SES uh, and what we're now talking about. And this relates directly to, I think, what the substantive uh, topic of this meeting will be, uh, which is the one that uh, Aaron uh, wishes to raise. I'm calling, oh, it's my phone, uh, that Aaron wishes to raise, which is uh, how the core SES mechanism that doesn't know about modules um, uh, versus the safe module system, which we're now designing, uh, how those relate to each other and whether we can arrange for there to be a clear layering boundary between them. Um, the reason why... Um, uh, this expensive new notion of pure and purifiable uh, comes in with the introduction of modules uh, is because uh, Mark, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. I'm thinking about how to say this. Uh, is because we want the initial, the top level state of a module to be, to, let's, let's just take the pure case. For, so for the pure loader, which operates at the SES root realm level, so that it can be implicitly shared by everything in the root realm, uh, in, or, um, in order to be implicitly shareable, it must not provide uh, any privilege, it must not provide any mutable state. So um, in that sense, the top level module state is an extension of the primordial state. So for SES, we went through a lot of um, a lot of the effort in making an SES system work is to give us a shared set of primordials uh, which are themselves pure. Um, and um, then uh, in the old SES, before modules, uh, then anything else entering that environment, any other code entering that environment, uh, did it by evaluation. Uh, the result of evaluation was not assumed to be pure, um, uh, but then two evaluations of the same source code uh, would be completely separate evaluations, giving you uh, um, a stateful things that are isol that are confined. Uh, they don't have any access to anything outside themselves that weren't granted, but they are internally stateful, and they're isolated from each other by virtue of uh, separate evaluation. Uh, the problem with that, once you start programming with modules, um, or actually even the problem in the old SES, 
uh, once you start really using that uh, um, uh, to do piecemeal loading of separate pieces of source code that you're using in a module-like manner, is that you now get identity discontinuities again. Um, uh, is that uh, in the case of, let's say, um, um, uh, let's say that uh, I, 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 I see something here, which is that the, 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 the complication that's being introduced is that the loader introduces a piece of shared mutable state. Which is the loader registry. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, and uh, this um, relates directly to a problem that um, Dan Connolly has raised, which is, have we broken um, our absence of communications channels within a root realm by introducing a loader with that shared mutable state? And... Um, uh, so, so the answer to that, I'm hoping, is, uh, is that we're adequately safe. It is, uh, it is important to note, or maybe valuable anyway, that monotonically changing state that you cannot observe the change of is an inter interesting intermediary between mutable state and immutable state and the loader likely fits into that bucket, where the only way you can find out if something is there is by loading it, at which point it's loaded, and so you can't tell whether you loaded it or someone else did. And that means, you know, and there's mechanisms like that that you can have effectively mutable state with no, uh, uh, with, that, with, with no visible side effects. That's true for pure modules. Um, well, the, the, the pure loader is the only loader that is shared across the root realm. Okay. Uh, and uh, for exactly this reason. Right. So, so if you have a pure loader which only loads pure modules, um, then it's, it's safe by construction. Um, it's, it's just that the loading is expensive. It's safe by construction uh, with an important caveat that needs to be explained somewhere well and carefully, which is a loader has to actually fetch the contents, the source code of the module from somewhere given the name of the module. Let's turn names of modules into module source code. And it typically does so by going somewhere external, like a file system or across a network or something. Ah, it's externally visible. So. Uh, and yeah, so that's externally visible I.O. And if the content of, if the initial content of the file can change over time, then the first time that it's read, um, uh, uh, the content can be different depending on the time from which it's read. So here's the stance that needs to be carefully explained, but which I believe is a consistent stance, which is uh, when you're running um, just SES inside um, a language implementation, uh, just considered in, in the conventional sense, uh, there's still a TCB, which is the language implementation, uh, that internally is running things on mutable memory, um, but the mutation of the memory that the language implementation is using, it's up from the TCB to make choices there such that those mutations are not visible at the level of abstraction where you talk about immutability in the language. Now, in this case, the TCB distinction is not language versus not language, uh, but it's um, uh, the code that sets up a new SES root realm versus the SES root realm itself. The, the, when, you, when you use the Realm API and the SES API to create a new SES root realm, you're basically in the position uh, that has equivalent power to setting up a new meta interpreter. 
rather than use the actual primitive Realm API, you could instead have emulated the whole thing with an interpreter of SES written in SES, and then you can do anything from that perspective that you can do by virtue of being in control of the meta interpreter. Um, uh, so then if you want to write a correct meta interpreter, it's important for you not to expose to the interpreted code mutability that is below the level of abstraction of the definition of the language that is being interpreted. So uh, in equivalent manner, I would say when you set up an SES root realm with a pure loader, you have to give it the IO channel, uh, the fetch, basically the fetch logic, that it will use to somehow dereference a module name into module source code. So it, that's where the responsibility lies to make the configuration decisions such that within the language created inside that root realm, there's no resulting visible mutable state. Uh, and uh, likewise, it's the same locus of responsibility uh, uh, that deals with the previous issue we just discussed, which is how do you arrange it so that the pure loader only loads uh, uh, modules that have been statically verified to be purifiable? If we adopt, let's say, chip story where we're using a cryptographic hash, uh, there's still what file, what, you know, what record of cryptographic hashes of things that are already approved or what signature verification key or whatever, uh, do, do I trust uh, to only indicate that something has passed a static checker uh, where that static checker is elsewhere and elsewhere? Um, and that's exactly the same kind of um, uh, TCB responsibility. So I think that uh, seeing the setting up of a root realm versus being inside of a root realm as being a um, inside the TCB versus on top of the TCB kind of dependency is, is a consistent story here. Mark, may I interject uh, that question I had earlier? Yeah, sure. Um, I was looking at make point here, and forgive me if I'm asking something that's probably already been answered a dozen times. Um, this harden function, does it return, uh, does it operate recursively on the object? Uh, it does operate recursively, but let's be, um, uh, uh, it, let's, let's be very explicit about what the recursion is. Um, uh, it enumerates all of the own properties of the object. Uh, it does it with um, get own property descriptors rather than get. Uh, so if you have an own property, which is an accessor property, it does not invoke the getter of the accessor property. If you have an own property, which is a data property, then it reads the value of the data property. Uh, within, if the own property is an accessor property, um, it recurs on the getter function and the setter function. Um, uh, it, it works transitively through uh, such property, such uh, reflective property traversals of own properties. And in addition, it uh, accumulates the, um, uh, the, um, the prototype links. Now, JavaScript has two different meanings for the word prototype, which we always need to be careful to distinguish. It enumerates the, um, uh, the objects that this object inherits from. Oh, and it does both of these enumerations after it freezes the object itself. So it first freezes the object itself, guaranteeing that neither of these things then change. Uh, once it freezes the object, it says, okay, what object does this object inherit from? It accumulates that into a set. It then does a get on property descriptors to do the recursive property walk. So it does the full recursive property walk of own properties, accumulating those objects that are inherited from into a set. 
Um, and then once the own property traversal has finished, with all of those objects themselves being successfully frozen, uh, it then asks the question, um, are all of the objects in the, I'm going to call it the superset, the, the set, not, not superset, oh god, terrible choice, uh, the inherits from set, um, uh, it then asks the question, are all of the objects in the inherits from set things that I already remember have been successfully hardened or things that I have successfully apparently hardened in this hardening itself? Um, okay. uh, and if the answer to all of that is yes, then it takes all of the objects that it hardened in this hardening pass, and it adds them, it commits them basically, it adds them to the set of objects we know to be hardened. Uh, and uh, that also reminds me of something that I skipped in the previous, in the story so far, which is even in the own property traversal, uh, for each object that I look up in that own property traversal, I also check it against the objects that are known to already be hardened, and if so, I stop. So the objects that are already known to be hardened are kind of the fringe of the traversal. Uh, and every time you successfully complete an entire harden, including the inherits from check, then once that entire thing is completed, then all of the objects in that pass in turn get committed to the to the already hardened set, the, that, that fringe. Okay. Um, on the second question I wanted to, I wanted to raise, and th forgive me if this is uh, inappropriate in the context of this simply being an example function. Um, I'm looking at this and I'm wondering about side effects. For instance, uh, there, there's two side effects that I see that are possible. Uh, for instance, you're passing in X and Y and Presumably, x and y are primitives; they're numbers. But uh, if x and y, huh? So I'm not, I'm actually uh, the the static checker in this case can see that for PT for the exported PT that y is a number. All it knows about x x is that it's pure, and in general, for other calls to make point, uh, it cannot assume that either x or y are even pure, much less numbers. Okay, um, but, but coming back to what I was getting at, um, I see a, po a couple possibilities for side effects in this example here. Um, first off, if properties of X or Y inside, uh, change, then the properties of, of what make point returns might change. And secondly, um, your two string is not operating on the hardened variables, this dot x comma this dot y, but on these external values. So two string might be disconnected in what it reports from the actual x and y. Again, I know that that's a detail and it's probably inappropriate for this example, but I felt I should sur surface those. Uh, so, um, uh, so first of all, uh, uh, no apology necessary and in security work, um, uh, details are often where the vulnerability lies. So, so, so definitely want, uh, you know, in general, anything that seems like, that seems puzzling uh, should be asked, even if it's a detail. Um, uh, so in this case, uh, there is no this. Um, X and Y are lexical. Uh, the X comma Y comma inside the object record uh, that's uh, JavaScript shorthand for x colon x and y colon y. You get to use that shorthand yep. when yep. the yep. name yep. of the property and the variable name are the same. Um, uh, I was thinking more of the two strings. Okay, so so let, let me do one and then the other. Um, so the harden, uh, we statically know when we see an object literal that the harden will proceed 
into all of the named properties in, that, appear, that appear literally in the object literal. So in this case, that we, know, we, we, we statically assume that Harden will dynamically enumerate x, y, and the two-string function itself. And therefore, if Harden succeeds, then those will in turn be Harden. Um, so that, and then any, any own properties of X and Y must also in turn, therefore be hardened. Just uh, to interject here. Um, so hardening is a mutation. It does, its return value is only a convenience. I think it's what's important here. It's, re sorry, it's return value is? Is only a convenience. The, um, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's an important convenience, but yes, the, the, po the point of harden is to cause the object graph that is rooted in its argument uh, to become hardened. Um, and if harden returns successfully, then it returns that root. And if harden for any reason fails to cause uh, the, that object graph to become hardened, then harden itself must exit exceptional, must throw an exception or something. Um, uh, so, um, and then for convenience, um, when it does return normally indicating success, it does return the root. So you can just wrap it around the uh, object expression that you wish to treat as, an, as a hardened object expression. Okay, so maybe I'm missing one, one part here where it, it sounds like you're saying that harden the function, when we're calling harden, it's hardening the arguments x and y. Is uh, that no. correct? It's hardening the argument to harden, which is the object literal. The, um, uh, the object literal has an x property whose value is the value of the x parameter and whose y property is the value of the y parameter and that therefore uh, the, re the recursive hardening of harden will proceed to harden both of those parameter values. It's incidentally hardening an extra object that's then thrown away immediately. What's the extra object? The argument to harden itself. That, mm -hmm. that argument with the history uh, literals. Well, the, the argument uh, to harden... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. In other contexts, there are lots of places where you're trying to harden multiple things at one time, and you pass in an object in order to capture all those ah. into a single call to harden. That's not the case here. That, okay, good, good. So there, there are two side effects that we can talk about uh, in this very code. Uh, one is the one that Michael mentioned, which is harden itself is causing the side effect of hardening things. Uh, that is, that should be considered a side effect, and in particular, um, uh, one unfortunate but uh, unavoidable case is that uh, if, any, if an object being hardened is itself a proxy, uh, the proxy can sense that it is that um, uh, the steps that Harden engages in uh, and can run user code during those steps. So uh, when we did the security review of the original Harden, um, uh, we were very careful to thinking to think about the order the order in which Harden does the operations on the objects that is hardening in this recursive walk, so that the invariant that a successful Harden is guaranteeing is an invariant that we can um, be confident of, even if there are malicious proxies inside the graph being hardened. Uh, so that's a necessary property. I believe that property is still in force, but that's definitely something that uh, it would be very, very nice to get more eyeballs on that. And eventually uh, it would be very nice to have a formal proof of that, which will be a rather hellacious formal proof. Um, uh, another side effect in the code that we're looking at is x, the value of x, might be an object with a two-string method that causes side effects. The 
use of it within the template literal is is causing during during a call to the two string method of the object returned by Harden, uh, when that two string method is called, uh, the value of x and the value of y will be stringified into the containing string uh, by calling their two string properties, and those themselves might be causing side effects. Um, uh, so those are the um, the potential side effects that I see in 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 this code specifically. Uh, other code that's worth examining would have other sources of side effects in addition. Uh, I've got to drop off for a bit. Okay. So, um, uh, Aaron. Uh, would you like to um, uh, explain the issue that, that you mentioned that you wanted to bring up, which is um, uh, the layering of um, module concepts uh, uh, versus the core SES concepts? Uh, yeah, so I guess I don't have a, a clear definition of what the goals are for sets just in terms of like what is the, the boundary um, and then in the most recent version of sets uh, I saw that you're you introduced the require function um, and so I thought I thought that was interesting uh, but unexpected I'm just pulling it up right now so I can look yeah, we added uh, a helper function um, called make require that helps you build a require endowment that can be passed into the into the realm. <clears throat> and the reason that we built it, uh, the reason that we have the CES realm itself providing that helper function, is because if the you can configure that object to uh, support a require of agoric slash harden by providing the very same harden function that was created to harden the internals of the CES realm. Um, so it, it seemed like a thing where it's it's <clears throat> it's not a slam dunk to implement some of this functionality by simply importing new strings into the environment. It, 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 that functionality kind of wants to interact with its parent environment, and so that's why we decided to have that helper function be um, a part of the CES realm itself. Yeah, not positive it has to go that way, but that's kind of what we did at yeah. the time. So, uh, Brian, please stop me if, if the, my, the following statement about it is unfair. Um, but the, um, the require that Brian is describing uh, was really kind of hard-coded in as a special case so that we can, could unbundle and separate parts of the SES implementation itself, such as require, uh, and then uh, put it back together, um, uh, I'm sorry, such as Harden, and then put it back together um, in a normal way, and at the same time have those separate pieces usable outside of CES so that they needed to um, uh, do their module linkage through some means that was generally available outside of CES. But... Um, the, this is an expedient temporary step because this mechanism does not in any way resemble the safe module mechanism that we're building up to, that, we're, uh, you know, that we've been dis discussing in all of these meetings. Um, uh, uh, we want to be building up to there and then once we are at that level, uh, once we have a genuine safe module system, uh, then we should revisit this special case require to see if it should still be a hard-coded special case inside the SES implementation or whether there's some way to have it make use of the principled module system that we have yet to build. Yeah, I think that that's fair. The, the immediate goal for adding make require was to allow 
code to be unit tested outside of CES that will also run in the same way inside of CES. So when you're outside of CES, you're going to say require harden or require NAT or something like that. And we want it to be possible to have that same source code that has that same require statement work both inside and outside. So this is a way of, of creating the require endowment for it. I think in the longer run, um, so I, I I think that, that make require and the configuration that we pass into make require will be an educational tool for us to figure out how we want uh, an API for a safe module loader to look. I think in the long run, we'll be building some sort of module ob loader object or loader hook out of some similar configuration, maybe out of a manifest of some sort that's, that's uh, scanned in and something that people can analyze, people can audit, people can discuss whether this manifest accurately describes the kind of authority we want to be passing around in the module graph we want to link. But I agree that in the, in the long run, this needs to be something other than an endowment called require because we really want CES to be able to support uh, ES6 module syntax. And that's not something you can do with a, an endowment. That's something you have to do to the realm itself so that it can be active at the time you're pulling in the code, the module that has those imports. So this is going to have to get um, lifted up at some point and, and be available earlier in the, the evaluation process. Uh, another uh, uh, goal I would like to state that I don't know if it's going to turn out to be possible in practice is right now the shim itself, the, uh, the, the SES shim combined with the, um, uh, the underlying realm shim, uh, both of those are currently very small. Uh, and they're and they're heavily reviewed for security. Uh, uh, we intend them to remain re uh, reviewable for security, um, uh, uh, so that we can have a lot of confidence that they have the security property we need. Uh, and in order for them to be small, it is essential that they do not parse JavaScript. Uh, and we're you know, using um, you know, Caridi's um, magic uh, eight lines of JavaScript code. The key thing there was that we can use direct eval on the string being safely evaluated as eval code, as script code being fed to an, an eval, that we can do that without parsing it uh, because the direct eval inside those eight lines imposes all the necessary constraints by other means. Um, uh, the one exception to that that we already have that we dealt with through a hack was the import expression. Uh, there is no way to safely deal with the import expression in the shim uh, safely and correctly doing it without parsing. Uh, so what we did instead is we use a regexp uh, in order to reject any code that looks like it has an import expression. And that inc includes something that looks like an import expression that's buried inside a comment or a literal string. Um, because with a regexp, we can't reliably know whether we're looking at code or comment or literal string. Um, uh, so we felt that was um, uh, adequate in practice for what we're doing now in the shim. Um, uh, it was worth it to keep the shim small and reviewable so that we could have uh, so we could have confidence. Uh, that leaves open the question of how do we bring in a safe module system? So the goal that I want to state um, is that it would be very nice for the safe module system mechanism to be built purely on top of the core CES mechanism so that the core CES mechanism didn't know about modules the module mechanism, because it has to hook import and export and all that stuff, um, uh, must parse, uh, but therefore uh, by layering, the danger of getting the JavaScript parser wrong is limited to um, uh, corrupting the meaning of code written using modules, but not 
endangering any other code from the missed parsed module code, since the missed parsed module code must still turn into script code that gets evaluated by the eval at the SES realm level. Can I add another wrinkle? Yeah. Um, so another wrinkle that we were addressing in the require, uh, the, the current, I will refer to as the require pack, um, is that it, it, you know, and you may have already mentioned this, is that it provided a nice pattern support for bringing endowments in where one of the key about, one of the key issues in any endowment is I've got an object from outside the realm and I need to not make it directly available inside the realm because it will have a evaluator out from outside the realm and so it'll, it'll break encapsulation. And so what you end up wanting is to pass an endowment in and then run code in the realm to wrap it up and, and, and attenuate it and make sure that it was, that, it, that it's not directly exposed to the unsafe realm code. And so arranging a pattern to make that work well was part of what uh, was baked into the, the, the manifest structure that we had in the require act. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. And, and in the process of that, uh, it, 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 I'm reasonably convinced, but this is something that we need to explore. I'm reasonably convinced that there will need to be, you know, some direct support for having a module system that is able to bring in, uh, um, uh, endowments or, or anything impure or what have you. Um, and, and, and that's something that as the secure module system is, 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 is nailed down, it'll be a lot more obvious what, what that would be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Mark, so in your, um, I, I agree those layering goals are really good ones. Can you currently imagine what that's going to look like? Are we sort of somehow using the parser, which we have less confidence in to transform the, source code that has import statements into something that does not and then have it, you know, transforming it into require statements somehow? Yeah, so, so, uh, so I'll, I'll present an unrealistic form for simplicity that's exactly along the lines of what you said, uh, which is assume that we just translated import into require and we translated a set of uh, exports into a single um, exports. Uh, so basically, we're translating uh, ECMAScript module form into common JS module form. Uh, well, before we go too far, did we did we actually answer Aaron's question? Or and I realize we're continuing on the topic, but I just want to make sure that we didn't leave it all behind. Uh, yeah, that, that was fine for me. Okay. Uh, let me mention, by the way, another agenda item, uh, Aaron, that I would really appreciate it if. Um, uh, uh, if we did during this meeting, if, if you're ready to do it, uh, which is uh, Aaron, um, uh, together with Dan Finlay, are at MetaMask. Uh, they are currently taking another JavaScript uh, module packaging system called Browserify, which MetaMask is currently using, and building a variant of it, which they're calling Sessify, uh, and uh, Sessify is currently duplicating module evaluation and they need to move to something that does not, um, uh, uh, for which I referred uh, 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 Aaron and Dan to our safe module draft document. Um, so uh, Aaron, if you could, uh, after we finish with this topic or get to a good stopping point, uh, introduce us to um, the uh, Browserify and Sessify and what their approach is to uh, packaging modules and how it relates to Sess. Does that seem doable? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, and that was a really good description. Great, great, awesome. Okay, so, uh, so, the, um, so in the fantasy, let's say we just translated um, uh, ECMAScript modules into CommonJS modules naively. Uh, I'll just uh, just mention why this is an unrealistic fantasy is that the semantics aren't the same. Uh, so the fantasy only applies 
uh, to, to modules that, are, that would be insensitive to the difference in semantics. Keep in mind that a whole bunch of production code in the wild is compiled with translators that make exactly that simplification. Okay, so it might be realistic for more code than I'm imagining, uh, which would be great. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, well, I'm not sure it's great. It's, it's, there are uh, a lot, there's a lot of tooling that lets you use the ES module syntax that translates it into um, common JS calls. And, 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 and then people write common JS modules that are, um, you know, that are, that are, that do all of the tricks that you can do with, uh, uh, or, or rather, they write things which look like ES, ES, ESM modules, but they do all of the tricks, the, the dynamic oh. code tricks that you do with. Uh, I see. It's not um, actual. It's not actually that they're insensitive to the change in semantics. It's that they actually depend on common JS semantics, while looking like an ESM module. Correct. Okay, that's pretty terrible. Yeah. Uh, so. But it's real. Okay. So, I, so in that case, I'll go back to my unrealistic fantasy um, uh, that we're dealing only with modules that are insensitive to that difference. Uh, we run each one through a naive translator. The naive translator does not package them together into a big text file. It keeps each module as a separate text file. A common JS module is syntactically uh, uh, script code, not module code, uh, and is therefore a perfectly valid thing to feed into a direct eval. Um, uh, the uh, direct eval that SES itself provides has, um, uh, you know, the, the SES mechanism uh, provides an ability to customize uh, two levels of global scope for the string being evaluated, uh, the, the, the uh, equivalent of the global lexical scope, uh, which is what, where the endowments get mapped to, and then the equivalent of the global scope, which typically corresponds one-to-one -one with the global this object for that compartment. Um, uh, since we would want multiple modules in a um, directory tree, effectively, um, uh, at, the, at the layer that understands about modules. We would want all of those, um, multiple of those, to turn into evaluations inside the same compartment at the SES level, and therefore into evaluations, evaluations sharing the same global this, um, we would need to give each evaluation a different require endowment and a different exports endowment. Because of the way common JS modules are defined, uh, the module level built on top of CES can do all of that by constructing and providing appropriate bindings for uh, require and exports as endowments uh, at the uh, at the CES level, uh, and that that uh, conceivably could keep the layers cleanly separated, so that the security of the CES level does not depend on the module parser. So I had a question. Mm -hmm. If we do provide virtualization to import, which is what I'm currently trying to do, mm -hmm. um, what is needed still within this uh, system? Just the outer lexical scope and globals, the intrinsics? So the, when you say providing customization, you're about the platform itself providing it? 
For now, yes. Um, okay. So, I don't think I can get it through the JavaScript language body anytime soon okay. without providing a host pretty much forcing their hand. Okay. So, let, so let's just hypothesize a, um, a node prime, a build of node that has your extension. Uh, and, uh, and now let's say that we're trying to build a CES with a safe module system that is implemented in a more direct manner uh, when running on node prime. Uh, I think, I think that, that that's a, a wonderful goal, and I think it's a doable goal. I'm hoping it's a doable goal. Uh, and and uh, such a thing being achieved would also um, help the momentum towards uh, pushing the required issues through the standards committee. Um, uh, so the, the issue would be that you would want to create a separate loader per compartment. You would want to also create the pure loader for the root realm as a whole, the SES root realm as a whole. Um, uh, Bradley, I think you might have joined the meeting after I went through the um, uh, the rules of what it means for a the pure loader to accept only purifiable modules, but it was it's very consistent with our previous I'm discussions. Familiar. Yeah, it's everything said today. I think is consistent with all of our previous discussions on that. Um, uh, and then the manifest uh, would declaratively describe cons uh, wiring and constraints of the allowed import graph, uh, you know, wi uh, wiring as in remappings and, and limitations of the import graph between these different loaders. Uh, and I think because all of that can be expressed declaratively, uh, it's therefore consistent with the mechanisms that I think you're advocating for node prime where the, um, the loading system is not within the same JavaScript as the, um, as the JavaScript that it is loading. Yes. Um, we still have some hard memory problems to sort out for it. But my question was more around outside of import virtualization. Is the only other thing we need uh, the ability to create these uh, new shared uh, global objects and new uh, potentially shared global lexical scopes? So, um, uh So that is the, the core thing that we're doing with Caridi's Magic 8 Lines of Code. We're doing it at some overhead, uh, and we're also doing it um, necessarily imperfectly. There's some semantics um, of doing it with the width on a proxy that cannot be accurate semantics. Uh, so, um, so the core hard mechanism that the realms and CES are built on um, uh, if you provided those mechanisms directly by the platform, uh, that would relieve tremendous pressure. Um, uh, the, whether that's the only thing we would need, um, uh, there are certainly other elements of the realm and CES shim that could benefit from being moved more directly into the platform. Um, so, for example, uh, CES has this uh, whitelisting mechanism uh, so that um, uh, everything that's everything in the realm, in the primordials that's not on the whitelist is removed um, uh, and only the globals on the whitelist are, are put into the per compartment globals. 
uh, so that there is no accidental uh, host leakage. Uh, um, uh, there's the transitive freezing, uh, the transitive hardening of the primordials uh, and the um, uh, hope that the result is pure, um, as well as the hardening of purifiable modules with the hope that our static analysis guarantees that the result is pure, uh, with platform support for purity, uh, we could have much higher confidence that something that we intended to be pure actually is pure or fails with an error. Uh, I'd, I'd much rather have the platform uh, check for purity at a deeper level rather than having to rely on, um, on uh, potentially incorrect static analysis. So there's a large number of asks. There's a large number of things that the platform could do uh, to that would help us do more reliably things that we're now doing with user code. Um, but I think all of those are secondary to the to the core issues that you've already raised. Because the only thing we can't currently do, uh, technically, is that global uh, bit. Just V8 has no incentive currently to implement that change. And I am unclear on how to implement it safely. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're making do well enough for now with the eight magic lines of code. So getting the import hook um, and the customize, the declaratively customizable loaders, um, uh, providing that so we can provide this loading logic per compartment, uh, that would be in fact a tremendous step forward even without um, uh, new platform mechanisms for the global. And I think that as the realm proposal proceeds through committee, the realm proposal itself requires that kind of globals hook. Uh, so at that point, it becomes a, a issue of um, uh, whether the V8 team will actively resist. Um, and I'm more hopeful now than ever before that, that uh, as this proceeds forward in committee, uh, that it, that uh, they are not going to block it. I'm, I'm more hopeful for that, but there's no guarantee there. Uh, we should proceed uh, we should proceed with the hope that we can simply move it forward by enthusiastic advocacy both in the committee and in the larger external JavaScript community as, word spreads about how useful this would be and as the adoption of the shim demonstrates um, uh, uh, utility. So get it, having the shim itself see more use, uh, that historically has been always the most powerful argument uh, for getting the platform implementers to be willing to add mechanism to the platform. It's demonstrated use by achieving the same functionality in a more awkward way. Uh, when you say customizing the import hook, I want to be very clear. The resolve hook that you showed is also, if I understood correctly, uh, also necessary, which is um, what is the logic what, by which a loader turns the name of a module into source code for a module. Uh, for example, where on a file system or over the network or wherever does it go in order to um, uh, dereference a module name into module source code? That has to be some, that that logic has to be providable by user code. Yes, so we're working on that because of memory problems. 
Um, I don't know how to share on this thing. How do I? This is new interface to me. Okay. How do I share? Oh, oh, yeah. Um, so everything... Ah, I see it. Yay. Uh, so we're trying to work through a nasty memory leak problem by holding on to refs in a bad way, so we're trying different models of ownership. Ignore that for now. Um, roughly, uh, let's say we have a loader, the echo loader. Okay. Um, and we have the default loader. Okay. These should ideally be able to be implemented such that if you wanted to create an entire recreation of the default, it's possible to do in this position, which I think is what you're asking. Yes. Yes. Um, that you can create, Doing so, you can, however, you can create is, a full loader out of whole cloth without depending on any prior loader. Yes. So with our current design, you have to manually call out to any runtime. The runtime doesn't automatically do that for you. Uh, this allows you to short circuit things. It allows you to completely change the behavior entirely. And it allows you to do stuff before and after resolution. Um, what we are calling resolution is the process of taking the specifier and whatever the call site is and transforming it to not source text, but a reference to a module. Because there can be multiple types of modules. Okay. Uh, but, and then, so a, so when you say a reference to a module, that's the result of the resolve, what kind of a thing is that? Is that the same kind of a thing as the call site? Uh, yes, it must be the same as the call site. And so result and call site have the same type. We are trying to work out a type that doesn't leak memory. Okay. Which uh, is hard. Okay, and the call site type is a um, uh, first class object with unforgeable identity uh, and is um, uh, uh, such that uh, uh, the registry for a loader can register a module instance by a pair of a call site and a specifier. Just the call site. The call site is the entry in the registry. Ah, 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 ah. Right, 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 right. And then resolve goes from call site and specifier to other call site. Got it. Yes. Um, okay. So from call site to, and then there, but there, so this thing, uh, so, so it's good that this can be provided by user code, but it doesn't answer the question of um, uh, where does the logic come from for, for actually dereferencing this into module source code? Ah, so there are a few ways we can do it. Currently, the buggy way we have it, essentially you can unwrap a call site and get what its body is. I'm going to write here just because convenience. Sure. Um, so roughly, uh, you would be like call site dot get body, and then this most likely returns something synchronously, but you'd have to actually await a body if it because it could be streaming in. Okay. And then body dot get formats and like body dot get. Bytes. Oh, right. These, this, are, this these is, are not the actual methods, but roughly okay. that's what you get. Okay. Um, uh, so as long as, uh, wait, wait. So, 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 sorry. Hold on. So I'm still confused about something. Who implements get body? User code can implement get body. Uh, to my knowledge, no. Because you provide the body when you create your own modules. So I, so, st so I still don't understand. 
the um, uh, how do I write code such that given a call site or given a call site and a specifier, um, my code determines where on, let's say, the network to go to find the source code corresponding to that call site and specifier. You would do it in here. You would not you would not shell out to your parent. You would actually go and perform an HTTP request and return a freshly minted inside your loader call site. So it'd be okay. like Okay, so I can make a call site object where I provide the call site object with the contents. Yes. Okay. Um, and at the, at the time that I'm making the call site, I have the parent call site and the specifier as the parameters as you're showing. Uh, so that's all adequate. That gives me what I need to create an entire new loader uh, from whole cloth, including the logic for obtaining the source code from elsewhere. I think so, yes. Okay, good. Um, this currently has memory problems that we're trying to resolve, though. Okay. Uh, rather than talk about the memory problems, since we, uh, we, we did have a... Uh, yeah, we can uh, skip that. Yeah, let's skip that for today. I do want to come back to it at some point. Uh, uh, on this meeting, um, uh, I would like to hear about uh, Browserify and Sysify. Um, so, uh, Aaron, um, uh, you're on. All right. Um, let's see how present now. Uh, can you see my screen? I can. Okay, great. Um, uh, a, a little bit. I can read at this font size, but uh, in oh, yeah. but but a larger font size would probably be better. Yes, that, that's that's certainly more than enough. Um, okay, as I change applications, if I don't fix the font size, please uh, interrupt me and remind me. Okay. Um, so, so first, uh, what is Browserify? Uh, it's it's just a uh, it's an app bundler. It, as I understand it, it dates back from um, when you know Node.js and npm were being introduced. We we had uh, you know we can pull down dependencies and import dependencies, these sort of things, and people. Uh, you know, web developers were like, this is great, I want to use it too, but how do we get all these files into the web browser? And uh, Browserify just uh, was introduced and it bundled all these different files together and dependencies together. Um, and then because all those things were written, or many of them were written with certain nodisms um, expected, like the, the process object and the global object, um, it just sort of shimmed those minimally. So here it's got that, yeah process buffer and global and uh, you know it doesn't polyfill like FS or HTTP or all these things fully but it um, it does provide some notice uh, I'm, I'm sorry you're you're assuming more background than I have um, oh um, yeah so wh how what more detail would you like me to go into? Um, uh, let's see. Maybe just start over from the beginning, and I'll interrupt more promptly when you say something I don't understand. Sure. Um, so, so Browserify is a JavaScript bundler. Um, you give it one or more JavaScript entry points, and it will analyze the code for require statements. Okay. And sort of walk, so, so, walk the dependency graph. Okay. So uh, first of all, when you say JavaScript entry points. Um, uh, can you say very concretely uh, what that means or what that typically means? Yeah, um, so th this is just a, a JavaScript file. Um, and so the content of that file might look like this. Okay. Um, and you might call Browserify like this, saying like, hey, I want, uh, here's my entry point. You can't specify okay. uh, mul multiple. Okay. Um, and then it will analyze that code and look for require statements both locally or to uh, dependencies. Um, and it'll turn them, you know, it has a small sort of bootloader or um, kernel or TCB or whatever you want to call it. Though so this is definitely not built with um, security in mind. Okay. Um, 
and then it'll output uh, a, a single JavaScript file that encapsulates all those things. And at, when it's run, it will uh, run your entry point. Okay. So the the so the 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 goal here is that bundle JS when run should preserve the semantics that you would have had if you had run main.js in a common JS module system where the other files named by main.js were reachable. That's correct. Okay. Um, and then it also helps uh, with some things because uh, the, the intention, you can run it in Node.js, but the intention is that you're going to run this in the browser. Okay. Which you can't buy the name browser. File. <laughs> um, and, and so it, it does a sort of shim some things like the global object, which is available in Node, which um, you know now points the window in this sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. If you you know want to know more about Browserify, you can read about it. There's this Browserify handbook repo which goes into a ton of detail. Um, but I want to point out just one part. This is sort of the uh, compile pipeline of Browserify. Um, and so I'm building Sespy, which is a plugin for Browserify. So we're still using Browserify, and we're just sort of hooking into the pipeline here. Um, and they have this fancy thing called a labeled stream splicer, and the stream is sort of the throughput of, of the of the compiler, and you can kind of jump in by using these names at certain parts of the compile pipeline. Um, so I guess it's first it's like walking the dependency graph and um, finding all the, the files, individual files. So, um, so, so let, 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 let me interrupt and ask some questions. Um, yeah. The if module A and module B both import module C, then under a common JS module system, uh, both A and B get the same instance of C. That's correct. That is true for Browserify, though we modify that in Sessify. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, the other thing is in a Node.js in a common JS module system. The argument to require can be computed. Uh, that doesn't work for Browserify unless you, um, I think you can manually specify additional modules to be included. Um, but in general, that, that breaks things. Okay. It, it, does, it does have some support for if you're using like uh, the file name and dir name and concatenating it. Or use it using path.resolve with these things, but if you're doing it like with a variable, or you you know you have some wrapper around the require function, then it will um, it will break. Okay. Yeah, good question. Um, so uh, we don't need a, so uh, this is the compile pipeline again. I'm not going to look at all of it, um, but basically it's walking a dependency graph and it's sending uh, JSON blobs through the pipeline that include the dependencies used by that file, and how they're named, and um, the content of the file. And then there's, um, you can use Browserify transforms. These would be things like, um, you know, converting CoffeeScript into JavaScript, or Babel, or some Minify kind of things. Um, and does the global that's named global here is in for I, I understand we're still talking about just browserify not specify is uh, the thing that's named global here is that the genuine global object of the environment that the resulting bundled file runs in yes it is okay um, and it, it's using self i think so it works in web workers and these sorts of things too okay uh, yes, that is the, the actual global object. Okay. Um, and so I guess the, the main thing I wanted to show in the pipeline is that it gets, let's see, um, is it at the end, it starts to look like uh, this, where it has like an ID, the, this is an ID for a file, this is a single file from your project or a file from a dependency. Uh, it has a list of the, the dependencies from that that file uses. 
and how they're named corresponding to their ID. Um, and then it has the content. What is what 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 is the ID generated from? Yeah, um, you. I think by default it actually is just an incrementing incremented number. You can set it to a hash. Okay. Um, you can keep it as the full file path. That's what it starts as, and then for um, you know saving space, it converts it into a number. Okay. Um, is but the, you can you could uh, customize that to whatever you want. To do. Okay. And the source code is specifically common JS modules, or can also be uh, ECMAScript standard modules. I don't think it supports. Uh, the, the, this new mod, the new module. Um, okay. I, I'm less familiar with that, so. It explicitly doesn't support it on purpose. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the the sort of last uh, second to last step here. Um, well, it uh, in the throughput of Browserify we get these objects like this, and then the last thing we, we do is we sort of turn it into a single file that has the, the kernel, they call it a prelude, um, and then it just contains basically this information here. Um, so then, let me open it up. I, can you still see the screen? It's uh, the um, the screen with the black background uh, could use a larger font. Okay, great. Um, um, okay, so now I'm going to move into talking about Sessify. And so it's a plugin for Browserify, so we're still using Browserify. Um, we just modify that last step that builds the single file so we can uh, replace the kernel with um, our own special thing. And let's see, what is, I guess I'll start with the higher level by showing an example. Um, so here you can find my uh, specified example. And when you run it, here. A uh, larger font, it, please. Yeah. Um, Thank you. When you when you run it over here. Um, Wider window, so, please. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me get it all going. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, here we have npm start, and what that's running is Budo. Budo is a little tool. Uh, for Browserify that, that reloads Browserify uh, when it detects changes in the source. Um, so that's just a little helpful as I develop and make changes to this demo. Um, what What so, is Budo short for? I don't know. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, but, it, but it's just a, a live, a Browserify live reload sort of thing. Okay. And uh, here we're using index.js as our um, entry point and we're spitting out this bundle file um, this is an argument to Budo saying that it should reload. Uh, and then everything over here is passed directly to Browserify. Here we're loading a plugin, which is my Sessify. Sessify gets an argument um, for a config, and we'll look at that later. Okay. But just to run it, uh, so when you run this app, we see that it has not been compromised. And then there's also this note that the friend was able to update the DOM. We'll see what that means. Um, so if we were to run this with um, just sort of vanilla browser find, excuse me. Uh, so now we're running Budo again, um, but this time we did not uh, specify the plugin specify for browser find to run. This is just what normal browser find would look like. And we see that this page has been hacked. <laughs> very, very scary. Okay. Yep. Um, yep. So now we can let's uh, look at what happened. Um, so this is index.js. So uh, well, even higher than that. Here's index.html. We're including the bundle. Okay. Um, 
bundles made from index.js. We're loading some code here, and then we're running some code. And the, the um, sort of situation for this demo is that uh, both of these modules were good, useful, friendly modules. And then sometime during the you know, maintenance of this application, one of the dependencies went rogue. And uh, that happens to be the foe, as you imagine. Um, looking at their source, oh yeah, I must explain. I'm using, for the sake of this demo, I'm using a Browserify feature that lets you uh, sort of override some of your dependencies with a local file or a file from this project. Um, and that just makes it so I don't have to like deploy these dependencies. Um, I can just edit them locally, which is convenient for this demo. Um, so then, so if you look at friend, uh, it's exporting a fun, you know, this object that contains a function and it uh, uses, in terms of platform APIs, it uses console.log and it's using the document.body and it's doing this very sloppy modification of the document. Yeah, you can tell that this code is written by an evil attacker by the lack of semicolons. <laughs> this is actually the friendly one. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, uh, and then we look at the attacker over here, um, and it's doing this sort of the same thing. It's uh, exporting an object that contains a function, and it's also using console.log and document. Um, so, we, so there's a couple things going on it, and I will slow down and look at each part. Okay. We saw that it, uh, you know, when we ran it in normal Browserify, we, we, the attack succeeded, and we, when it was run in Suspify, the attack did not succeed. And um, let's, you know, let's examine why. Sure, can you, can you, sorry, point, ex go back to the attacking code and explain what specifically yeah. the attack is? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, so let me start here uh, at, at the entry point. So we're loading foe, we're loading friend, we're calling the action on foe, or we're calling the action on friend. Okay. Um, when we, when we load, so I'm going to ignore some things that are here and just look at um, that we're exporting this action here that does the attack. Um, so we're, we are calling this from our, from our code here. We're saying, hey, foe, do your action. And the foe is you know, modifying the document. Um, so, and that's what, that's how we end up with, uh, you know, this page here. Right. Now it looked like the friend was also modifying the document. So what rule is the foe violating that the friend does not violate? Um, well, in the normal, in our uh, you know unsafe Browserify version, uh, we weren't expecting the foe to modify the document. Yeah, that's another part of the assumption. Um, we are you know maybe we were just using it to to format some code or parse something. Um, but uh, so if we let's say we didn't call the foe's action, um, well it can still attack us because it can attack us at runtime or it can modify the action of, say, the friend module. <laughs> um, so, so That's good. In normal browser fight, it's very, it's very scary, right? Uh-huh. Okay, um, good. So then if we boot this up with Sessify, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't have this issue. And the reason why is the Sessify config that we specified in the command line and um, so this is returning an object, this config object, ah. and we're specifying the dependencies, and we're saying the friend does get access to the document. Got it. Here, Great. This dollar sign is a shorthand to say these are the endowments, and I have a few other options, configuration options that you can provide at this level. Okay. Um, and we're not giving anything to the foe right now. Um, but of course, Sessify is not a magic bullet, and so if you have a bad configuration like this, you know, you're still, uh, I need to restart it because I changed the configuration. Um, you're still going to get into trouble. Uh, right? Oh, I also. Oh, we're, we're actually in a slightly better situation. But um, now we're calling the foe, and now we got attacked. Um, okay. But if you notice, this, 
previously, this situation in Browserify was still bad, right? Because we called friend as action, but foe had modified friend. Yes, yes. But now we're actually OK, um, as long as we don't call foe. Well, foe could still do the attack at, at runtime. That was kind of a bad situation. But the, the point is, uh, foe was unable to modify friend. Okay. And Good. The reason for that is the, the way m module instantiation and caching uh, works is different in Setsify. And we basically provide fresh copies of a, mo of, of a file, of a module, to um, of an import when you require them. So this gets a copy of friend, and Fo gets a different copy of friend here. And it does successfully modify that, but it's its own copy. So that doesn't affect other parts of the application. Okay. And this has the uh, huge cost that um, uh, when you've got a, um, uh, you're basically uh, unfolding a, uh, a graph of dependencies into a tree. And you're you're paying the a cost proportional to the size of the tree, rather than the size of the original graph. Yes, um, and so this is take so we're you know I've started playing around with this in MetaMask. And MetaMask is a very large app with a very large dependency graph. We you know we ship megabytes and megabytes of JavaScript, um, and it it turned the just the initialization time, the boot time, from like less than a second to more than eight seconds on my machine. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm sure there's lots of stuff to do to improve this, but uh, just sort of the naive approach um, has a significant impact that may be not viable. So um, uh, with regard, did you, have you read the uh, draft safe documents document, and safe modules document? Um, uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Um, so there's basically two styles of safety uh, that uh, we describe there. Uh, one is uh, safety by, pur by purity, um, which is, corresponds to the way the E language worked and corresponds to the way the Wyvern language works. Uh, and then there's uh, safety by... Um, uh, least authority endowment with uh, remapping and wiring and constraints on the import graph uh, through a manifest. Um, uh, and uh, for legacy code, uh, the second is much easier to practice than the first, which is why we practice the second, uh, even though the first is more straightforwardly safe. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, so you were on the call when I showed the um, uh, uh, the purifiable module and the pure loader. Um, the code that you're concerned with in Sessify that you just showed us uh, is parameterized is 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 basically. Uh, both both friend and foe assume a document. The pure way of securing it would be to have both friend and foe export a pure function that takes a document as a parameter, and then the um, uh, the decision to give the friend the document and not give the foe the document would be a decision of how to invoke those outer functions. So basically the entire content, the entire existing content of each of those files would become nested as the body of an outer function. I'm going to use the E terminology, a making function. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, the Wyvern terminal, actually, I'll, I'll use the Wyvern terminology. It's a functor rather than just than a function. It's a distinguished, it's, it's a uh, form that's uh, distinguished by the, by the language. Uh, but it's basically a pure function that takes 
those endowments as arguments and returns what is effectively the module instance that depends on those endowments. So the functor can be invoked multiple times, but because the functor is pure, each of the resulting module instances are isolated from each other, except to the degree that the parameters uh, cause them to be connected. Um, so, uh, so the first question is, um, would it be, is the code that you're interested in bringing into Sessify a code that is sufficiently under your control that the means to secure it might be to refactor it into the pure form? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think to do it correctly it involves, um, you know, using a parser and these sorts of things. Um, just to make sure that we're, we are correctly wrapping it and the code wasn't expecting that and then like closing other functions ahead of time. Um, but yeah, we have, I mean, we are the compile pipeline. So if we want to mutate the, the source, um, we can do that. Okay. And because you're not using uh, ECMAScript standard modules, you're using common JS modules, um, uh, nesting them all within a function so that they're, they're multiply instantiable uh, would work perfectly well. Um, yes. Great. Yeah. One of the things that's unfortunate about ECMAScript modules is that import and export can only appear at top level. So you cannot simply wrap a module in a function in order to make the module multiply instantiable. I see. Um, I I wouldn't be surprised if in MetaMask we have a few dependencies that are using the export import syntax, but we are via Babel uh, translating them to the common JS syntax. Okay, great, great. Um, so I think that would be the so since since you you're you're not stuck with a legacy problem, uh, I think that should be the first line of attack, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, Daria's thesis is uh, dissertation is um, uh, specifically about the Wyvern module system as an OCAP friendly module system. Um, uh, the Wyvern language is a statically typed language with uh, effect types as well. Um, so, so there's more involved in Wyvern than would be relevant here. But, but everything relevant here, I think, can be learned well from Wyvern. Daria. Could you, uh, is that? Um... Yes, I think that's fair characterization. Okay, great. Um, and can you send a link to the right documents about Wyvern uh, to read to understand the module logic to be applied to pure ECMAScript modules? Okay, I guess the best would be the paper, but I'll send both. I'm going to, okay, I'll send, I'll send it in the chat here. Okay, great. And now I get to find out how chat works in Meet. Yeah, it took me a second to find the chat tab in here. Um, oh, so I guess just one last thing. Here I have uh, the, dev, the Chrome DevTools uh, flame chart of the MetaMask bundle with Sessify and without Sessify. Um, and here it's running without, looks like we booted in 150 milliseconds. Um, and let's see, that's about that much dev. And I'm not that familiar with this tool, so I don't know how to read too much into it. Oh, and some other points are like the ending memory usage, the heap is like, 80, 80 megabytes or something. Okay. I'm not familiar with this tool at all. Um, and then, you know, here, here's a running with Sessify and with all these, um, you know, not deduping the module in initializations. And the plane graph is much deeper and, and uh, you know, it took, it took what, five, um, close to six seconds to do 
Okay. And memory is up closer to 100 or something. Okay. Hopefully that was useful for someone because it doesn't do too much for me other than, hey, it's not as fast. Okay. Um, are these public stats? Could I you... do have them upload. Yeah, they're on a GitHub issue. Um, uh, MetaMask says by issues. Per do you have a full heap snapshot? Um, is that included in these profiles? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, I need to learn how to capture one and then I can upload them. Um, we are, I am, so because, uh, one reason why I think the memory footprint is so large is I am. Uh, caching these module instantiation results because, let's see, uh, in browser find pretty much everything's, you know, it's sort of working at the granularity of files, but um, I do, I can't entirely remove the cache and just always generate a fresh copy because when, um, why is it, it's like within a module when files require the same thing. No, I don't remember why I did this. Maybe there was like an infinite loop inside a module or something like this. Um, but for whatever reason, I needed to cache within a module. So I do keep copies of that for a dependencies position in the dependency graph. Uh, is there some code you could show us where you're doing this? Yeah, I don't know if that's going to elucidate it any better. Um, but let's take a quick peek. Um, so, in, so I didn't show really much of the internal code to specify. Um, the uh, sort of you know kernel bootloader thing is the result of this prelude template. And I'm sorry if this is a bit sloppy. Uh, we're throw we're inserting sets in here. Um, the config that you created goes in here. Um, the, the sort of top level thing we call is load bundle, um, that gets called with, uh, a, with all the modules that end up in runtime that were the result of that, uh, that pack, that collection of sort of large JSON object of modules. Um, I, I'm, not going to go over every line of this unless you really want me to. Um, I just the the thing about sharing modules rather than yeah. reevaluating them was the part that I, I wanted to. Yeah. Let me. I'm almost there. Let me just sort of walk down to there so it has some context. Okay. Um, so we're loading the bundle. Um, we have this. We create the require um, the require function that we use to use internally to to instantiate a function, and that has this, we have this module dependency path, which is like this required this, required this, required this, required this. We okay. just turn that into a, a string delineated <laughs> by this. Um, and then inside this global cache, which is what's, you know, why we have this large memory overhead, uh, we have this local cache where we hold the module. So what actually goes in the local cache is the the module ID, which might be like um, this is the like buff, you know node module slash buffer slash index or or it's just a number or something like that, um, and that holds the the module object. And the only thing on the module object is the is the export. So under what conditions? do two different imports of what would normally be thought of as the same module, under what conditions do they um, actually end up sharing uh, versus duplicating? 
Uh, clearly, yeah. mostly you get duplication, which is why you're getting the bad performance that you showed us. But it, but clearly, what you're saying is sometimes you get sharing, and I don't understand what the difference is. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to distill the question. Um, so if you have if uh, a if module A requires B and requires C or down in C and C requires something from D and C or C requires um, two different pieces D or requires D twice or something like that that will be a cache hit that will you know reuse the same thing but then a B if that uses D that's going to get a fresh one Does that make sense it makes sense but I would think that there would be zero occurrences of that uh, the, the you're, you're saying of the of um, of of a single file C require having two requires to the same dependent module D. Yeah, let me clarify. It's not necessarily a single. It's not a single file. It's a module. So if and and this required cache also applies to files within the same module. So if I have a module... I'm sorry, what's uh, the, has, when you're, 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 you're making a distinction between file and module that I think does not correspond to anything I know. Yeah, that's that's fair. Um, this is uh, this has been occurring as a sort of a pain point a couple times, is that the, gr the level of granularity that Browserify works with um, in its result it are just files. Everything is files. Um, and we sort of have this sense, uh, or I needed to invent this sense of, of modules, which are like the collections of the files. Um, and they sort of have the same trust uh, profile because they were you know, published at the same time through the same process. And what is the thing, when, a require, when you do a require, and you use a string name in a require, is that name, what does that name designate? Does it designate one of the files in the original source tree, or does it designate this new module concept, which is a collection of files? It designates uh, a file. The module concept is only used for this caching mechanism. And unfortunately, I can't remember the exact reason why I needed to introduce it. But um, I think uh, I think it was it was just like shoot. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll need to reinvestigate why I did that. Okay, it's it's um, I think. The thing that we, uh, that the name fed to a require names, the thing that you know that that, that name designates, um, I think that that unit is necessarily um, uh, corresponds to the common JS notion of a module. Uh, so your individual files. At the common JS level are modules. So this other thing you're calling a module is a very, very different concept. Um, I'm not sure if that's okay. So yeah, what I what I mean is, uh, when, let's say you just say uh, you know require buffer or some module like this that um, will point to the file that is the the main file as specified in the package JSON or defaulted to index.js for that module. So uh, module is a collection of files and there is a default file it's, for that module. Uh, it sounds like you're talking about packages. Ah, uh, maybe. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good way of thinking about it. Okay. Um, so, 
for uh, for reasons I need to uh, dig up why, I had to set up this caching system based on the package perimeter. Now, thinking about things in, in terms of the package perimeter, I think makes sense because they share a trust profile. Okay. You know, all the files in a package were, were published with the same process, so they're going to, you know, those files don't need to distrust each other. Good. I guess you can make arguments that they should, but I, I think I think it's still a meaningful uh, containment. Okay. Um, we've we've actually so, been, in, in, in the legacy support scenario for the safe module system, we've been making the same assumption that um, uh, that the things that our manifest talks about and does the wiring probably correspond to packages uh, um, and that all of the modules in a package would be loaded into the same compartment and would therefore share a loader and share uh, a set of globals. So, so I think we're making compatible assumptions there. Uh, the reason why I'm being hesitant is that the package concept is very much part of the JavaScript ecosystem and you know, comes from NPM and all that, uh, and the pervasive use of, of people talking about code using package.json. But it's not a language concept. The, uh, the ECMAScript standard has a notion of individual modules. It has no notion of package. Uh, nevertheless, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that package is the right unit for us to be talking about in making these least authority distinctions. Yeah, I, I said I use the, the package delineation only for this cache, but I realized I actually use it for the, um, for the config as well. I use, uh, use it in the config to specify what endowment for platform APIs should be exposed um, to modules. I specify that at the package level. Okay, good, good. So we're very much traveling the same road. So uh, to, to re-ask, now that we have the terminology distinction, uh, let me state a hypothesis uh, as to what you're explaining, and tell me if I got this right, that when package A and package B both import the same module from package C, that they each get a distinct copy of C, whereas uh, within one package, if module A within, within the package X and module B within the package X both imports module C within the package X, that in that case you get sharing rather than duplication. That's correct. Okay, good, good. I understand that. Good. Um, so I guess I have I one more thing I could show off and specify. Um, and I'm sure, sure I, I, you know, I think it's related to other projects in, in this ecosystem is that um, I do have some static analysis and auto generation for the config. Um, uh, I think it's a needle. Uh, yeah, so it's looking, yeah, this is, I'm not super happy about this code, but it, um, it tries to identify, you know, what globals are being used doing a, a static analysis, and then it, it generates a, a config file. Um, and let me, just show one of the somewhat horrific uh, outputs of this file. This is not the most updated version of this, but it'll give you an idea. This uh, all of this is auto generated. I uh, just want to. Um, I, see, I see the name tofu. Uh, I want so l l let me ask. Uh, uh, Bradley's been doing work on a tofu tool, uh, uh, where to the name tofu comes from trusted on first use. But Bradley's specific thing uh, uh, statically analyzes uh, source code to um, 
identify uh, dependencies and identify, uh, basically identify the things needed to create a least authority set of grants that should enable the current version to work so that we can notice if a later version requires, if a part of a later version requires more authority than that part of the earlier version requires. Is, is tofu, what is tofu in your case? Yes. So, so this is in, inspired by his tofu project. Okay, great. The name just kind of stuck. The thing it's actually outputting is probably very different. And, um, you know, as I learn more about his project, he's doing much more intelligent analysis than I'm doing. Um, so, uh, basically, sorry that that name is there. It's going to be confusing. Um, but, um, anyways, quick look at this output file. This is obviously JavaScript. Um, got some, some helpers here at the top. Um, and I, let's see what, we have some specified in the config for specify. There's some um, default globals that are exposed. And I am including some things like set timeout, um, just because a ton of modules use them. And maybe I should be more concerned uh, with timing attacks, especially because I'm doing uh, <laughs> cryptography via JavaScript implementation. Yep. Um, but, uh, uh, anyways, it, they're, they're the default set right now, as well as the console, you know, A2B, some, some of these things. Uh, uh, it's what I have right now. Um, the, and the reason why I added them is just because almost, you know, such a large majority of modules wanted to use them. It just made a config file gigantic. Um, but yes, um, that obviously needs to be readdressed. Um, so a lot of helpers here. And then, uh, we're creating, the goal of this file is to create that same config file we saw in my example that was you know, very simple. It was like friend gets the document. Um, and it's doing this with a level of the abstraction that it brought with it, you know, it's generated with this file, where it's saying exposed module. And so we have a module called, say, uh, a sync. And then through static analysis, it's determined that that file is trying to use console.error and it's trying okay. to use window. Okay. Um, the, I've actually, I think I improved on the parsing of window, but um, if it's not in this version, it's not really worthwhile looking at. Um, no, it doesn't look much better. Um, so we can see there's, you know, this, this one, uh, there's this mod, this package called BroRand, and it's detected it's trying to use crypto and MS crypto. Um, and then there's this one called JSON RPG filters, and it's detected to try to use console.error. Um, and we're saying, you know, this is this level of extraction around creating the thing called exposed module. And then we, I'll, use, I'll do it with Broran just because it's used in a ton of different places. Um, we now have this other thing called exposed to dependency, uh, and this is um, we're basically we, we set up this config here that Broran should get crypto and MS crypto, and then for each position in the de dependency graph for Broran, we're giving that config we specified earlier to that location. And so if you, and the reason for that is, let's say we determined, where, where's, where's a good one? Like async gets window. Obviously this is, okay. I, don't, I don't know why it needs all of window. I think that's just a static analysis issue. So um, uh, let, let me, when you, so when you say gets, as, as in async gets window, or bro rend gets crypto and MS crypto, uh, yeah. the way in which these things appear to, uh, Brorand is as if they're global variables, correct? Correct. 
Correct. Yeah, it's passing it as an endowment when we initialize the module. Okay. Okay. Uh, so here we're giving async window. And without looking at the implementation of async, I don't know whether or not it, it ex intentionally or unintentionally exposes window on the exports of this package. Okay. So are you, are you actually uh, using the SES eval mechanism separately on each of these modules with the stated, endow with, with the stated endowments? Yes. Okay. Um, and, you know, many, many times over um, each time it's initialized because okay. I don't have that maker wrapper. Okay, good. Um, so, oh yeah, so m my point is, so, so uh, it makes sense where I use async that it needs to, it needs window to do its job. Um, but then let's say for whatever reason, async.window or async.global is exposed, like it, it, it exposes this for some reason. Um, and then my attacker comes along and they add async as a dependency of theirs. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes sense. So they want to do something async. So I'll, I'll give, you know, I'll allow that module to get access to async. I unwittingly gave ac you know, it access to window as well. Um, and because there's that issue, we specify the endowments specifically in their uh -huh. like, position in the dependency graph. Does okay. that make sense? Uh, I think so. Let me let me see if I can restate it. Um, uh, common JS, there is an exports object, uh, and the exports object um, uh, uh, has a set of named bindings, which, even though in common JS it's a general object, we assume that those named bindings are statically determined and stable. Um, uh, so over here. Um, just like we want to declaratively state what the global variables are that appear as endowments uh, on a per module basis, we also want to declaratively state what the names are of the ex on the exports object that a given module exports. Is that correct? Um, no, I'm not entirely sure that that's correct. Okay, then try uh, then, then try again. Yeah, so so there's this um, there's this package. Uh, uh, the, the best one I want to use is there's this. Uh, it's in the for the UI bundle. Um, so uh, this extensionizer module is just a wrapper around the the Chrome API that's provided to browser extensions. Um, oh. And it is an extremely powerful API. Ah. Oh. Um, and so this is that's that's really handy because it just makes it easy to use those APIs whether you're on Firefox or Chrome or Opera or whatever. Um, and if I and I, and I want to use this helper in a few places in, in the code, um, but if an evil dependency suddenly required extensionizer. Um, then it might seem, okay, they want to use extensionizer, and that doesn't seem, maybe that wouldn't seem nefarious or you wouldn't notice it. Um, but what you're accidentally giving them is access to the whole, you know, like Chrome API. Well, you're only giving them that if extensionizer exposes that. Uh, right, which it does. Okay. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I expose these things to extensionizer intentionally because that's its job is to make those things available in a convenient and consistent way. Um, and then I use extensionizer in, in the places where I want to use it. Okay. But then an attacker comes along and says, hey, I also want to use that. Okay. And we need to not give it that. And the way we do that is by explicitly saying um, those permissions that we set above for extensionizer, they, they are open. Oh, they get them if you require extensionizer just from the root of your app, or if this module extension link enabler, which requires extensionizer. If you do it from any other package path, package dependency path, then it would not get those uh, in down. I, I, did, I did not follow this. Okay, so uh, we have a package called extension link enabler. If that requires a package called extensionizer, 
uh, the, the instantiated module that it gets is instantiated with the endowment specified above. Okay. The Chrome API. But if you were to, if if uh, a package called a attacker were to request extensionizer, um, it would not. Uh, the extensionizer that gets instantiated would not get the endowments listed above because it was not specified in this part of the config. So uh, I'm not sure yet. The oh, okay. the so let me ask a question. Uh, the extension what the extensionizer that the attacker gets the, would yes. the would the attacker actually get and something that is an extensionizer made by the same extensionizer source code? It's made by the same extensionizer source code. Yes, it's a fresh it, copy. Okay. And uh, and but when it was instantiated, it did not contain the the endowments it needed to to function. But it was referring to those endowments by global variable name, by free variable reference. So yes. In order for the source code to run, those names must have been bound to something. Uh, why? Uh, because otherwise, when you evaluate the variable name, uh, it will throw a reference error. Ah, yeah. So it, it internally is, you know, it doesn't know where it's running. Uh, so it, it happens to be using a type of. Uh, or or uh, it's doing an undefined type of undefined check to make sure this, this, this okay. module happens to be doing that in its implementation. Um, so because it doesn't know if it's running a Chrome or Firefox and what the, the, the API object is called. So it, so is it generally the style that your modules are written to use type of? in order to tolerate not being provided the things they were expecting? Yeah, that's a common pattern. That's, not everyone's going to do it. That seems... Oh, so I, I want to I clarify um, that if, if most things are expected to say run in the browser and then they want to just like start using the, you know, the document to uh, add a pen child to the document body or whatever, those things might not be checking for documents. Uh, specifically, in the case of the extensionizer, it's it's trying to standardize an API that is different across platforms. So okay. it is very carefully checking, like is that okay. this. Okay. So it's so it's not in this environment. So it's not the general style across modules in general. It's for things that have special authority, especially things that in which the form of the authority might differ from pl platform to platform. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, if it's not sure about the what APIs are available. In that case, it's a common pattern in JavaScript to do that. Okay. Um, anyways, I guess the main point I want to, to say here is like we want to give some permissions to certain modules, but it's important uh, to only give those permissions to modules when or sorry, packages when they appear in a certain position. If they appear in a different position, then it could have been, you know, we didn't approve that. We didn't make sure that that was when it was appropriate to get those things. Why not, when it appears in this other position, why not simply make it an error for it to appear in the other position? Um, that's fine, except that, um, when when you say appear, you're talking about the, the if, usage of an API. Well, so or or if, the, if 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 I understand correctly, uh, something uh, in at extension link enabler or something at or under extension link enabler should be able to import or require extensionizer, and it'll get the real extensionizer. And anything trying to import or require it that's not in that position should not get the real one, should not get one that has any of the real endowments. Uh, so the way we've been thinking about that in our safe module work 
uh, is as constraints on the import graph. And if you import something that is not allowed by the enumerated, um, uh, 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 you know, the the allowed import graph. If you're trying to do if you're trying to do an import that's outside the uh, import relationships that are allowed, that we just turn that into an error. Uh, that makes sense. I think a reason that there might be a situation where we don't want to do that, where uh, if we have like, um, uh, if we have like a closely trusted module and that needs to do, um, I don't know, some something it wants to modify the DOM or something. Um, and then we have like less trusted and that also wants to use this, this sensitive module. Um, and here we give it like full document access and here we only give it, um, what is it, document.create element or something like this. Um, and so I'm not, <laughs> this idea is not fully baked in my head, but um, I guess the idea is that we, we, we need to do this here. We need the full document here. We need to be able to append things, et cetera, okay. in, this, um, in this usage of sensitive. Okay. Um, but in this one, we, we only need to do the specific thing, which is creating elements, and then less trusted might you know, be handing off these the permissions in here somewhere else. Okay. Um, and does this vaguely make sense? Yes, it does. It makes actually complete sense. And once again, we're actually traveling on the same road. Uh, you'll see in the safe uh, JavaScript modules document um, a attenuator and a rewiring. Um, uh, what one one case that we don't actually have in, in our examples yet, which we should is where the same module is instantiated uh, uh, with different attenuations uh, for, and wired to different users. Uh, and that would correspond to this example. Um, uh, but we uh, do have a, a case where uh, somebody's importing FS and the FS that they get is um, an FS that only gives them access to some files. And, so, yeah, and, and, yeah. and there's another example where somebody's importing process and they're only getting access to process dot, what, what was the name of the? Release, no, no, that's OS release, uh, process. Oh, maybe OS is the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. But in any case, it's just, just given one that just has the elements uh, that we that we specify that that uh, we're we're writing attenu attenuator code where we're writing code that does that restriction, but in the in the simple cases like you're showing here, which is actually the only things that most of our attenuators currently do, uh, stating those attenuators declaratively uh, has some attraction to it. Uh, but uh, the main point is that you are creating two different instantiations of sensitive both of which think they're accessing an object named document, but where the, the actual thing that is bound to document in each of their namespaces are different attenuations of the genuine document. And then when closely trusted imports sensitive, it gets one of those sensitive instantiations. And when less trusted imports sensitive, it gets another one. So this is perfectly good object capability style. Uh, you've gone farther than we have at stating the simple attenuations in a declarative manner, uh, but, um, but absolutely you're on the right track. Uh, um, am I okay on time? There's just a couple more things I'd like to show off. Uh, so uh, people, uh, what's been generally going on is that as people run out of time, they drop off. That's one of the reasons why we record the sessions. 
Um, uh, and at some point, we'll sort of have a general sense of now's a good time to adjourn. Um, but uh, why don't you go on for, for you know, um, a small amount of additional time until you get to a good stopping point, and then I think we'll go ahead and adjourn for the day. Uh, Mark, sounds good. One yeah. more question. Yeah. Um, can we reserve some time in the Tuesday or Thursday next week meeting for uh, talking about Jessica and Jesse and TypeScript support? Yes. Okay, that's great. I have to go now. Okay. Also, if we do have some time, uh, Aaron, uh, after this, we can take a look at the memory snapshot, and I can just show you what you need to do. Cool. I would appreciate that. Thanks. Um, okay. So, with the large events you got, you get a config file. Um, um, what? I wanted to oh yeah so what I wanted to show off was I have to it's here at the top the bottom here I'm mutating it uh, we, um, we, we writing stuff we lost some of that audio. Can you state the whole uh, sentence again? Oh yeah. So um, the next thing I want to show is that uh, you know we, we were just looking at all that config generation. That's the code that's up here. Um, and then at the bottom, I've uh, appended some sort of overrides uh, to that auto-generated config. And here's where I could constrain the um, uh, the endowments. Or I could add some uh, attenuations that are that the you know static analysis was unable to. Uh, and, the la the yeah. last we heard was the static analysis is unable to. We did not hear anything after that. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, things that the static analysis were unable to generate. So here's anyways. Here's all the things that. Uh, as a developer, as an engineer, I wanted to additionally constrain or otherwise just over. Did you get that? Uh, otherwise, over uh, and then nothing after over. I assume you, it was override? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, now the things here, like, uh, as you know, you can't overwrite the uh, the two string on the prototype inside of Cess. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with this issue, um, so I basically have this option to to. Um, well, I'm sorry. I want to distinguish overwrite versus override. Um, so okay. in Cess, uh, object dot prototype dot two string is a non configurable, non writable property because object dot prototype is frozen. So if you try to change it on object prototype itself, I would call that an overwrite because you're trying to change the actual binding. Whereas if you create a new object that inherits from object prototype and you try to give it its own two string with assignment, I would call that an override. Uh, and there's something called the override mistake in the JavaScript standard that everybody has implemented, um, uh, where the mistake is that um, uh, the assignment fails because it's overriding a, an inherited property that is non-writable. Uh, so which one do you mean here? Yeah, I'm talking about override. Thank you for giving me some vocabulary to describe that. Okay. Um, so when you try to override the two string, um, sess or it explodes inside of sess. Okay. You can um, you can so, you, you can overcome that locally with using define property rather than assignment. Um, mm. uh, but it's also the so, case that for a small number of these things, like specifically object uh, prototype, uh, we're going to be repairing those so that assignments work. 
So if, if you want to make it work in the short term, you can change the defined property, or you can wait for us to fix the bug uh, for the small number of objects that should be overridable, like object.prototype. OK, great. Um, so I'm looking forward to that fix. In the meantime, I'm, uh, I've created this option that lets you uh, just disable, or, or um, it's called skip sess, but what it's doing is it's instantiating these modules via a plain eval statement in in the normal root um, JavaScript context instead of inside the SAS iframe. This could lead to identity discontinuity. Oh, well. yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyways, that, that was just sort of a, a quick sloppy fix. OK. Um, um, and there's other reasons why I, I you're, you're familiar with this one, so I wanted to just point that out and why we have this here. But there's I've had to do that for a number of other reasons. This one's doing it via the the two string symbol, sort of the same same issue there. Uh, some things are doing just really strange things, and I slightly described them here. I probably should have included links to their source that showed the offending code. Um, but basically, through trial and error, I had to disable SAS in a, in a number of cases. Um, this is, I guess, trying to mutate object.keys, which just seems uh, like a wild thing to do. Um, uh, yeah, this is trying to figure out what the global object is. And one, and I, I wasn't able to. To. Um, uh, I'm sorry. The thing that's trying to mutate object.keys. Yeah. Why don't you just fix it so it doesn't try to mutate object.keys? Ah, yeah. So. That's going to probably be your suggestion in a bunch of these cases. I'm not the author of these modules, and they may appear in the middle of my dependency graph. So it's sort of out of my control, though I could you know, rewrite them or fork them and then sort of insert them into my dependency graph uh, that way. But in general, the goal of this project is to be able to operate on most stuff on NPM out of the box. I see. OK, so, so this goes back to the, my, the previous question I was asking about um, uh, module styles is um, uh, it sounds like you are trying to accommodate a significant amount of legacy code that should be CES compatible, uh, in which case the um, the legacy style with the manifest uh, explained in the uh, safe module document uh, is probably going to relate more closely to what you need for the legacy code. Yeah, uh, I, I probably should have led with this that, uh, you know, we already have a large JavaScript app with a large dependency graph. Um, and our hope is to make those the application that we build more secure without uh, rebuilding everything. Okay. So, okay. So yeah, how do we how do we make that um, existing legacy third party code safer? Okay. Uh, something that tries to modify object keys, uh, anything that tries to modify the actual primordials, uh, where it is not a goal of CES to enable that code to work. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 fair. I don't know what uh, I don't even know what it was trying to do or why it was trying to do. But, okay, uh, so for I whatever reason that that was an issue. Okay, so um, I, so in going forward with Sessify, I hope we can all agree that we are, although we are trying to enable much legacy code to work, uh, that. Um, we're not trying to enable all legacy code to work, and in particular, we're not trying to enable any any legacy code that modifies the primordials to work. Yeah, I think actually what even, uh, I think what ha is happening here is, is an, yes, it's an accident. Um, <laughs> so if object.keys exists, then it would, then this module, this file, exports object.keys. It sets exports and module.exports to equal object.keys. 
And then just in case it also exports this shim on exports.shim. All mm -hmm. right. And what the problem is exports equals object.keys and then object.keys.shim equals this shim. And so it's it's added on this function shim to object.keys. The oh, object. Yeah, so you should just rewrite this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just fix it. I I agree with you. Um, I think that is going to be a recurring pattern. I think it will be, if there's a lot of that, I would be surprised. I would not be. Okay. But, um, anyways, that was just a random example out of a hat right there. Okay. Um, of like the accidental incompatibilities with sets. Okay. Um, so I'll look at the rest of these in less detail because I, I just kind of want to get it over with. Um, uh, this, this is another one. It's trying to figure out what the global is. I'm not sure what it's doing specifically, but sometimes it's like, um, you know, these, these, some of these modules are meant to run in a bunch of different places and, you know, global might not be there, window might not be there, self might not be there. And then it also is trying to protect against like accidentally getting the wrong global. So it's like, well, the, the, you know, the window object seems to be there, but is window dot capital O object equal to capital O object. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, I have mobile. So I, don't know, I had an issue um, tricking it. Yes. So at least on that point, this was brought up when we would, when I was looking at the huge amount of noise the tofu tool creates. Um, you really, we really need to figure out a way to do essentially ahead of time dead code elimination to kind of circumvent these kind of UMD wrappers is what they're generally called. Mm -hmm. uh, UMD standing for universal module description, which is yeah. not technically true, but um, <laughs> this is something that is in a lot of packages of trying to detect your outside environment to determine what you should do, mm. what you should evaluate to. And so the only oh. thing I can imagine us being able to do is using um, some presets of, hey, please try to make it look like we're going to run in this environment and optimize out any identity checks. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Anyway, moving on. Um, so I, I always, uh, in, in the current implementation of Cessify, I always expose a window object as just an object that, that's there to be the global. It's not necessarily the actual window. Um, and then when I'm doing my static analysis, if I see that they're just using window and it doesn't look like they're using any sub keys on it, then I don't expose window to it. And then if I see they are using the subkeys, I just ignore the window part and only expose those subkeys on an object called window. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I, 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 it, it, it sound, I mean, that sounds like it corresponds to this issue we were talking about, it, about um, uh, filtering down the available properties according to a tofu analysis of which properties are currently being used. Is that about right? Yes, I think I think that's correct. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I just want to highlight uh, some other ones because there's just weird things in here. Um, I guess this one is is trying to set the constructor. I, I'm not familiar with that being a common pattern. It's been written in TypeScript. I think. Um, I don't know. If I'm, yeah, it's not uh, not immediately obvious where it's doing this. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna worry about, oh wait, okay. it's attached. But that's, that's not what I said, I said it's attached. Did I get redirected here? Oh, I did. Um, okay, I'll, I'll leave that one aside. It seems to be saying the constructor. Okay, um, uh, Aaron, I, th I, I, th I think I'm, I'm going to declare uh, adjournment unless there's a uh, objection. Um, I think I think we've kind of 
we kind of have the picture here, um, and uh, we can go into more depth another time. Uh, when we before we go into depth another time, uh, I encourage you to read our draft safe module document uh, and to take a look at the uh, Wyvern documents that Daria posted. Okay, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Great. Um, I'm not sure how many of these I'll be able to attend. They do start at 5 a.m. my time. Ooh, ooh, um, ooh, you're in Bali, right? That's right, yeah. Ooh. Uh, um, uh, okay, let's correspond on the SES strategy list about uh, whether we can arrange some special meetings at times that are mutually acceptable to um, a significant number of participants, including you. We'll make that just a few exceptional meetings, but keep the schedule as the default schedule. Uh, I, I would appreciate that. Uh, I do watch the, the videos, um, so I've been enjoying those and, and benefiting from those. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, thank you. I think I spent a lot of time on that um, and got some good suggestions there. So thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was awesome. Yeah. Um, Aaron, are you able to stick around for a few minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, then I guess the next question. Uh, should I should I continue and record well, or is this? You can probably stop recording. This is just tooling usage. Okay. Okay.